Hello, Saddleback. It's good to see you. I'm so proud of all of our campuses, all 12 of them at Christmas. Every single one of them broke a record. Buenos Aires, Berlin, Moscow, um, Hong Kong, and uh, you know, Corona, and uh, Huntington Beach had over 1,000 people. Can you imagine that? Over 1,000 people at Huntington Beach and Corona each. And uh, Rancho Capistrano, San Clemente, and the Grove in Anaheim had over 2,000. That's called a mega church, folks. All right. Uh, and then Irvine, Saddleback Irvine, had over 3,000 uh, in, in a high school. Uh, it, it was just an amazing uh, week. And as you heard, as Leo pointed out earlier, over 4,000 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ. And uh, if you want to know what keeps me going, I am addicted to change lives. I mean, I, 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 one of those could have kept me going for another good month. <laughs> 4,000, I'm like amped on overdrive right now as we get ready to go into our new series. Now in three weeks, we start the most important spiritual growth campaign we've ever done in the history of this church. I've been working on it nearly two years. It's called 50 Days of Transformation. And I guarantee you, it's gonna transform your life for the better. It's already transformed my life in many ways of thinking, even as I was just studying for it. In the small group material, in the sermons, in the verses we're gonna look at, the projects, all the stuff we're gonna do. And so it's gonna be in about three weeks, but in, in, in the next three weeks, this week and the next two, there's some things I need to teach you, I need to tell you to get you ready for this massive improvement in your life. And this weekend I want us to look at the issue of how God changes us. God loves you just the way you are. We talked about this at Christmas. He loves you unconditionally, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. And so he wants to help you grow. He wants to help you become more like his son. And during uh, 50 days of transformation, we're going to look at seven key areas of your life where you need to be healthy, where you need to be balanced, where you need to simplify, focus, double down, and make sure you're getting maximum impact out of all seven areas of your life. We're going to look at spiritual health. We're going to look at physical health. We're gonna look at your emotional health. We're gonna look at your mental health. We're gonna look at your relational health. We're gonna look at your financial health. And we're gonna look at your vocational health or, or your job. Now, God's goal is to transform you in all of these areas, making you more like Jesus. How does God change us? Am I just like walking down the street one day and all of a sudden, zap, I'm just transformed? And all of a sudden, I'm filled with love, and I love everybody. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says this at the top of your message notes. As God's Spirit works within us, we are being transformed. Now, circle the word being. That's a continuous process. It is incremental. It is not instance. It is a process. It's ongoing. As God's Spirit works within us, we are being transformed transformed, it's not a one-time event, to become more like Christ. This change from one degree of glory to another, one level of maturity to the next, comes from the Lord. I love this verse in the message paraphrase. It says, our lives become gradually brighter and brighter. That's what I want to happen in your life this next year. I want your life to be gradually brighter and brighter. I don't want you to be a dimwit. I want you to get brighter and brighter every day of your life. Now, the classic chapter on how God transforms us, on how God changes, how God grows us, is Ephesians chapter 4. If you have a Bible, I want you to open to Ephesians chapter 4. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. All the, uh, the outline uh, have all of the verses we're going to look at, but we're going to look at all verses in Ephesians chapter 4. And in this classic chapter on growth and transformation, God gives us the six elements that he uses to transform us. 
and to make us into the people he wants us to make you the woman God wants you to be, to make you the man God wants you to be. So let's look at these six elements. You might write these down. Number one, transformation requires, this is gonna surprise you, coaching. Coaching, yeah. Transformation requires coaching. We always grow faster with a tutor. We grow faster with a trainer. We grow faster with a coach. We grow faster with a, 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 a spiritual partner. Uh, a, a mentor, somebody who's motivating us to go on. Even superstars need coaches. These athletes who get paid hundreds of millions of dollars over a period of years, they all still have coaches. Vocalists have vocal coaches. Athletes have athletic coaches. The top CEOs in the nation all have personal life coaches. You need a coach in your life if you're serious about being better at the end of next year. What does a coach do? A coach maximizes your strengths and minimizes your weaknesses. Now when you look at the Bible, you find out all of the great leaders in the Bible, they all had coaches. Uh, for instance, Joshua was coached by Moses. Elisha was coached by Elijah. Solomon was coached by David, and David was actually coached by Samuel. Uh, the 12 disciples obviously were coached by Jesus. Uh, Paul coached Timothy. Timothy coached others. Uh, John, the guy who wrote the book of John, he, he coached a guy named Polycarp. That's a wild name, Polycarp. Polycarp coached a guy named Irenaeus who would refuse to deny Christ. And uh, the, all, all of those guys were martyred. Uh, but in 2 Timothy chapter 2, look up here on the screen, verse 2, the Bible says this. Paul's talking to Timothy, the guy he coached. He says, Timothy, I now want you to take the things that I've taught you and pass them on to other faithful men who will be able to pass them on to others. Now notice in that verse, there are four generations. Timothy says, I, Paul says, I coached you. Now I want you to coach somebody else who will be able to coach somebody else. We pass it on from generation to generation. You, right here, and everybody who's listening to me right now, you are benefiting from the 11 life coaches I've had in my life. Over my lifetime, I've had 11 different men who were mentors, models, and coaches for me. And, and, and the result of Saddleback Church and the benefit of all the things that I get to teach you, many of those things are things that they simply taught me. If they hadn't taught me that, you wouldn't be blessed. Now, who are you gonna pass it on to? Everybody needs a Paul and everybody needs a Timothy. Everybody needs somebody that they're learning from and everybody needs somebody they're passing it on to. Now, the Bible tells us in Ephesians that God has given five kinds of coaches to the church. These coaches are group coaches, and notice what the Bible says, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. Christ gifted some of us to be apostles, another word for that today is missionary, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are five different kinds of coaches in the church. So that his people would learn to serve and his body would grow strong, this will continue until we're united in our faith and understanding of the Son of God. Then we will be mature, just as Christ is, and we will be completely like him. Now I want you to circle some things in this verse. Circle would learn, circle would grow strong, and circle the phrase will be mature. Those are the three reasons God gives apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to the church. These are spiritual coaches. And they coach on a group level, but God says, I want you to have a coach on a personal level. And if you're serious about your life, you need to get a coach. Or at least you need to get a training partner. Uh, and by the way, how do you find somebody who's gonna be a spiritual coach to you? Do they have to be perfect? No, then nobody applies if you have to be perfect. They only have to be one step ahead of you. Find, some, find just somebody say, during 50 days of transformation, find one person, say, hey, let's kind of coach each other. That's okay to do too. You can kind of coach each other. I'll help you and you help me. I'll spur you on, you'll spur me on. But it always starts with transformation requires somebody speaking into your life. You need that in your life. Number two, transformation requires learning the truth. 
And we find that in the next couple verses. Now Jesus had said back in John chapter 17 that truth was important for change. In fact, in John 17 we have Jesus praying, the prayer he's praying the night before he goes to the cross. This is his final prayer before he dies on the cross and then will be resurrected. And in John 17, 17, he says to the Father, he prays to God the Father, use the truth to make them complete. Your word is truth. Make them complete. There's a theological term for this. It's called sanctification. Sanctification means just to be made complete. It means to grow up, it means to mature, it means to be transformed, it means to become the way God wants you to be. God says the way you are sanctified is through the truth. Jesus said when you know the truth, the truth will set you free, and he says use the truth to make them complete in your word. Now, what is this saying? If you really wanna change, any area you wanna change, you need to know and apply the truth in that area. If you wanna change your finances, you gotta know what God has said about finances and apply that truth to your life. If you wanna change your marriage, you gotta know what God has said about marriage and, and apply that truth to your life. If you wanna change your sex life, you gotta know what God has said about sex or money or time or anything else. You gotta know and apply the truth. Truth is what changes us. Here's the goal. Look at this, Ephesians chapter four, verse 14 and 15, the next couple of verses. He says, then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because somebody has told us something different or made a lie sound like the truth. Now let me stop right there. God says that one of the marks of spiritual immaturity is that other people can dissuade you from the truth. He says, I don't want you to be a baby believer. I don't want you to be spiritually mature. And he says, do you know a spiritually mature believer is they're always changing their minds about what they believe. Well, I believe this, and I believe this, and I believe this, and I believe this. And they let anybody uh, kind of tell them something different, make a lie sound like the truth, and they accept it because they don't know the truth. When you don't know the truth, you know, that's that old cliche. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And it's true. And he says, instead, this is the mark of maturity, instead, we will hold to the truth. In other words, we're grabbing on. We'll hold to the truth in love, becoming more and more like Christ. Now, that's the third time he's mentioned it in this passage. Becoming more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Now, why does God say you got to know the truth if your life's going to be transformed? I'll tell you why. Because every self-defeating behavior in your life, every single self-defeating behavior in your life is based on a lie you're believing. And if you wanna change your life, you gotta identify the lie and go, you know, that's just not true. And then you change it. And, and behind every self-defeating behavior, it may be a lie about myself, it may be a lie about God, it may be a lie about other people, it may be a lie about success or life or fame, it may be a lie about love or marriage or sex or money, but it, every time I believe a lie about something, that, and, and the world is full of lies, it tells you all these lies, every time I believe what the world says instead of what the word says, then I get caught in harmful behavior. I may believe a lie about my past that just isn't true. I may be a believe a lie about my worth that isn't true. I may believe a lie about my present or my future that just isn't true. That's why the truth sets you free. Now Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus didn't say I teach the truth. He didn't say I point to the truth. He didn't say I'm one of the ways to the church. He said, I am the truth. Truth is not simply a principle, it is a person. And the more you get to know Jesus, the more that becomes the standard of, well, that's not true, because Jesus wouldn't do that. I am the truth. Now, because Jesus is the truth, you can trust what he says. Look at the next verse, Ephesians 4, 21. Since you have heard all about him, Jesus, you have learned the truth that is in Jesus. And that truth is his word. Now, there are four ways that the word of God will help you. And notice, here on the screen, here's what the Bible says. All scripture is inspired by God. 
and it's useful to teach us. Here, notice the four things the Bible is good for. If you want to know what's the purpose of the Bible, it's all contained in this verse. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us four things. What is true, okay, and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives, it straightens us out and it teaches us to do what is right. Now look at that. It is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped for every good thing God wants us to do. Transformation comes through truth. So, during the 50 days of transformation, we're gonna be in this book a lot. We're gonna be in it a lot, because the more you get in this, the more it's gonna change your thinking about life, about love, about people, about your past, your present, your future, your values, your legacy, all these things change when you understand the truth. Now he says, it teaches us the truth. That shows us the path to walk on. It shows us where we get off the path. It shows us how to get back on the path, and it shows us how to stay on the path. Those are the four things that the Bible does. Now, if I want my life transformed, first thing I need is I need a spiritual coach. I need somebody who's speaking into my life who's encouraging me. God says, God puts people in our lives so we can help each other out. And then I need to learn the truth, all right? Number three, transformation requires new thinking. New thinking. Now, I talked a little bit about this at Christmas, but you're gonna hear me talk about it over and over and over because all change starts in the mind. Transformation requires new thinking. If you wanna change your job, you don't like your career, you gotta first change the way you think about your job and career. If you wanna change your finances, you gotta first change the way you think about your, your money, debt, the way you think about bills, the way you think about saving, spending, all these different things. If you wanna change relationships, you gotta change the way you think about the relationship. It all starts in the mind. You've heard me say this many times. The way you think determines the way you feel, and the way you feel determines the way you act. If you wanna change the way you act, you don't start with that. You gotta, if you wanna change the way you act, you gotta change the way you feel. And if you wanna change the way you feel, you gotta change the way you're thinking, because it's a thought that's creating every feeling. Every thought is created by a feeling. So I've gotta change, if I want my life to be transformed, I've got to think in some new ways. The battle is won or lost in the mind. And what you think, you are. Now let me be very blunt about this. Let me be just, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be very blunt about this. If you really wanna be different this next year, if you want this to be the best year of your life, the rest of your life, the best of your life, if you want to be transformed, you say, I don't wanna go through another year like this last year. I want it to be different, I want it to be better then you're gonna to have to stop conforming and start transforming. You're gonna to have to stop being conformed to what the world says and being transformed by what God says. That's a change in your mind. Romans 12, two, look here. Do not conform to the values and opinions of this world. Instead, let God transform you by teaching you the right and true way to think. I know people who are Christians who spend more time listening to talk radio than they do reading the Bible. Hello, whatever you listen to, talk to, read the most, that's what you're gonna be transformed by. I know people who spend more time reading magazines than they do reading the Bible. Spend more time reading the paper than reading the Bible. Well, guess what, you're, you're conforming not transforming. You're being conformed, not being transformed. God says, if you want to be changed, you gotta let God teach you the right way to think. Let me show you what God says about in the world. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 19, the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. I love this in the message. What the world calls smart, God calls stupid. <laughs> that's, that's pretty blunt. What the world calls smart, God calls stupid. There are a lot of educated dunces in God's opinion because they're, they're spouting off things that aren't really the truth. They're all messed up. So knowing this, here's what Ephesians says. We're getting all these from Ephesians 4. Verses 17 and 19 says this. So if you want to be transformed, don't keep living 
as the ungodly do. He's talking about unbelievers, people who don't know Jesus. For they are hopelessly confused in their thinking. All I have to do is turn on the TV and, hear, and realize that. There are a lot of people who are hopelessly confused in their thinking. They call right wrong and dark light and light dark and sweet bitter and bitter sweet and on and on. He says they're hopelessly confused in their thinking. Their closed minds are full of darkness. God's talking about people in the world. They're far away from the life God gives because they have shut their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They don't care anymore about right and wrong and they've indulged themselves in all kinds of immorality and evil thinking and the constant desire for more. That was written 2,000 years ago. You could have written it yesterday. <laughs> Look at that. They don't care about right and wrong anymore and they've indulged themselves in all kinds of immorality, evil thinking, and the constant desire for more. What am I saying? If you really want your life to be transformed, to be what God meant it to be, then you gotta get the true view of you and the true view is often the exact opposite of conventional wisdom. It says stop conforming, start transforming. Ephesians 4 verse 23 says this, there must be a spiritual renewal of your thoughts and attitudes. And that's why in this uh, book, Transformed, which we're going to uh, give to everybody who's in a small group, uh, and, and this book is, is really fantastic. It's got a lot of stuff in it. It's got uh, notes in it on transformation. It's got all the small group studies uh, in it that you're going to use. It's got some goal setting worksheets on the seven key areas of your life. And you're going to set some goals in each of these areas. And uh, it's got 50 daily devotionals. Why? To be transformed, not conformed. And you need to spend time with God every day in a daily time with God. The Bible says, let the Spirit change your way of thinking. So what's the goal? The fruit of the Spirit. There are nine qualities. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, kindness, meekness, self-control. God wants to build these in your life. But you know what we do? We, rather than changing the way we think, we try to just change the way we act. Trying to change the way you act without letting God change the way you think is like going out and taking a, well, let's say if I, I've got an apple tree in my backyard. Right now it's all bare. There aren't any leaves on it or anything. How about if I went out today or tomorrow and I start tying apples to the branches? And then I say, and I call Kay out and say, hey honey, look at this, look at all the apples on our tree. And then I go to the orange tree next to it and I tie a bunch of oranges on it. That's what a lot of people try to do with their Christian life. They to try to tie on some visible things. Fruit is an inside job. It starts on the inside. It happens in the mind. And you cannot transform your life on your own power. Now number four. The fourth thing you've gotta do, and this is how God changes this, is transformation requires cleaning house. Cleaning house. There's gonna be some things you gotta clear out. Now we talk about spring cleaning, I want to encourage you to do December end of the year cleaning. Cleaning house in your mind, in your body, in your spirit. Look at this verse, Ephesians 4, 22. So, get rid of your old self, which made you live as you used to. That old self that was being destroyed by its deceitful desires. Now circle the phrase, get rid of. I once did a study on how many times God says to get rid of something. And it's all through the Bible, things we're supposed to get rid of. Now, depending on what you want to change to get healthy in that area, you're going to have to get rid of some things. For instance, if you want a healthy body, you're going to go home, have to go home and get rid of a bunch of junk food in your house. And you already know where it is. <laughs> Even the special stashes. If you, want to get, if you want to get healthy, you want to be transformed, you want to have more energy, more strength, be more alert, be more aware, be more alive. Irenaeus said the 
glory of God as a human being fully alive. I want you fully alive at the end of the year. I don't want you sluggish like you are right now after Christmas. Yeah, and, and, and if you're gonna do that, he says, then you're gonna have to clean some house. And you have, maybe have to go throw a bunch of junk food out, out of your kitchen. Now, how about other areas? If you wanna have a healthy mind, you may have to unsubscribe to a few magazines. Really, is all that gossip stuff educating you? Is all, all those gossip things you're reading about other people, really, is your life gonna be any different if you learn nothing about the Kardashians this next year? <laughs> Why would you waste one minute of your life reading about somebody else's sorry life? Yeah, you should clap for that one, okay? <laughs> Cleaning house may mean you need to block a few channels on your television, okay? You may have to block, it. you may have to go into the parental guide and even though any kids aren't living at home, you set a parental guide for yourself. I'm just not gonna watch that junk. I'm not gonna fill my mind with poison. That's cleaning house, mentally. You may have to clean house in your schedule. Most of you are trying to do too much. My goal as your pastor is to get you to do less this next year. Does that sound better? But to do the right things. To do less. And to not spend stuff, don't spend A priority energy on B priorities and C priorities. You go home and you make a list of all the things on your schedule. A priority, B priority, C priority. Then just do the A's. Forget the B's and the C's. Urgent and important are not the same thing. And so you may need to have to do a little house cleaning in your schedule so that you can be transformed. In your heart, you might have to do some spring cleaning or December cleaning in your heart. You know, I have a habit, I've done it every year in December for I don't know how long. I have a little uh, a piece of paper and I've given it to you many times called Heart Cleansing for Personal Renewal. If you'd like it, it's just a list that I read down that says, is this in my life? Is this in my life? Is this in my life? Do I need to confess this? Do I need to confess this? Do I need to confess this? <clears throat> I had a little brochure years ago that I used to carry with me, then I lost it, and so I, I just created my own. And uh, we've given it out several times. If you'd like it, you can just ask me on a card, say I want the, the uh, personal inventory list, and I'll send it to you. And I go through that at the end of every year going, I am not carrying garbage from this year into next year. I'm not gonna carry anger or worry or fears or lust or jealousy or whatever, depression. I'm, I'm not gonna carry a lot of garbage, emotional garbage into the new year. I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna get, get rid of it. And I'm gonna confess it to God. Augustine said the confession of, good work, of bad works is the beginning of good works. So get rid of your old self. Look at this next verse, Hebrews 11, 12, verse one says this. We must get rid, there it is again, that's house cleaning. We must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially any sin that distracts us so we can run the race that lies ahead of us. God has a new, exciting race for you this next year but you gotta get rid of the stuff that's holding you back, that's slowing you down. Now, why is that so hard? Why is it so hard to get rid of bad habits? Have you noticed? It's easy to pick up bad habits. It's very hard to get rid of them. Have you noticed this? Yeah, well, if you haven't noticed, I don't know where you, what world you're on, what planet you're on, <laughs> okay. But it's not really easy to get rid of bad habits. And so I want to explain to you before we actually get into transformation why it's hard to do that. There are four reasons. Write these down. The first reason why it's hard to get rid of a bad habit is because I've had them a long time. You didn't collect your habits and your hurts and your hang-ups overnight. It took years to get as messed up as you are. <laughs> Many of the patterns you established in childhood, uh, and by the way, they may have helped you when you were a child. They may have helped you cope emotionally. 
They were survival skills, and you were in a very not safe environment, and you learned certain habits and patterns of reacting to people when, uh, as a young child, you were kind of vulnerable. And, and a lot of habits, they may be self-defeating, but they're familiar. And, and you know them, and you're used to them. And that leads me to the second reason. They're hard because I identify with them. I identify with my bad habits. And I talked about this on Christmas uh, Eve, that we often confuse our identity with our, with our defects. We say, you know, I'm a workaholic, or uh, I'm always passive, or I, I let other people have their, or I'm aggressive, or I'm, or I'm timid, or I'm an overeater, or I'm, I'm this or that. And we identify with our habits. And, and, and then what happens is when you see yourself in a certain way, you set up a self-fulfilling prophecy that you you act like you expect yourself to act. And, and sometimes when you have bad habits, you say unconsciously, if uh, you have a fear of change, if I change, who will I be? Because this is me, I've always been this way. I've always been pushy. I've always been a perfectionist. I've always been argumentative. I've always been, and then say, well, if I, if I, if I change, who will I be? And so you're, you're worried about your identity. There's a third reason, and that is because they have a payoff. They have a payoff. One of the great principles of life that I've learned is always true is this. Whatever gets rewarded gets repeated. And whatever is being repeated is being rewarded somehow. We don't do things that aren't rewarded. So anytime you see a negative behavior in yourself, or in your husband, or your wife, or your children, or anybody else, self, kids, your mate, you, you could know that there's some kind of payoff. Uh, maybe it's just temporary. I mean, if mom tells the kids to come to uh, dinner, and nobody comes, and she asks them politely, and nobody comes, and finally she yells, and she yells, you guys get in here to dinner, it's getting cold, and everybody comes. What are we doing? We are programming mom to yell. We are rewarding what we don't want. We're only, we're only responding to the negative rather than the positive. And we do this to each other all the time. People do it in marriage all the time. You set your husband up. You set your wife up. And you, you reward negative uh, uh, behavior. And uh, there is always some kind of pay. Now <laughs>
Sometimes people fear, you know, if I rock the boat, well then maybe something bad will happen. Maybe somebody will walk out of my life if I'm transformed. Really? Where do you think those fears are coming from? The Bible calls Satan the accuser of believers. So you need to understand that transformation uh, requires cleaning house and it's not gonna be easy. Number five, let's move along quickly. Transformation requires honest community. That's the next thing Ephesians chapter four teaches us. And Ephesians chapter four uh, tells us that, that there's some things you're never gonna be able to change on your own. You need people in your life, you need support, you need a small group, and that's why we insist on everybody getting in a small group. If you don't get in a small group, nothing's gonna change in your life. Sorry, I'll just be honest with you, nothing's gonna change. Because in a small group, you get the support you need to change. And in Ephesians 4, verse 25, it tells us this. I love this in the message paraphrase. No more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other. So if you lie to each other, you end up lying to yourself. What's he saying here? He's saying, you know what? Everybody for change needs a community where they're accepted unconditionally. And that's what Saddleback is meant to be. A place where when you blow it, People don't rub it in, they rub it out. I've said many times, this is a church for people who don't have it together. If you're perfect, please go find another church. Because we don't want you here, really. We only want people, there, there are two kinds of people. Everybody, those who've known they've blown it, know they don't, they're not perfect, and those who pretend like they're perfect. They pretend like they've got it all together. We know you don't have it all together, so why are you trying to pretend? You say, no more pretense. Just tell your neighbor the truth. You know. I'm struggling. If there was more confession of temptation, there'd be fewer confessions of sin. We may waste an enormous amount of time pretending. So listen very closely. If you're serious, I mean serious, about being a better person this next year, about being transformed, not conformed, about making progress and growing, you're gonna have to be in a group where you get close enough to people that you know that they're gonna love you unconditionally and you're gonna love them unconditionally and you can say anything and it's okay. They're not gonna blow you up. They're not gonna walk out on you. Real friends walk in when everybody else walks out. Real friends, as I said, rub it out. When, everybody, when the world, the world, when you make a mistake, the world wants to rub it in. In the church, God says, you're supposed to rub it out. And the one place where we can be real is in these small groups. Look at the next verse, verse 32. He's talking about these groups. Be kind and loving to each other, forgiving each other, just as for God gave you in Christ. So he says, God's been gracious to me. God cut me a bunch of slack, so I'm gonna cut you a bunch of slack. And, and, and when you make a mistake, as I say, we, we rub it out. We be kind. We, we're loving. We're forgiving. This is the way we do in small groups. And here's another uh, instruction for our small groups. Verse 29, never use harmful words, but speak only what's helpful for building others up. Circle the word others. He says when you're in a small group, you should not build, speak about things that build you up. He says speak about stuff that builds others up according to their needs, not according to your need, that it may benefit those who listen, not benefit you. He said no room for ego here. Don't use harmful words. This is the kind of thing. Now, uh, most of you are already in small groups, but some of you in, in 50 Days of Transformation, this is going to be your first group experience. So let me just review real quickly what we call our small group ground rules. Number one, what's said in the group stays in the group. Number two, don't minimize others' pain. Okay, just listen. Okay. Don't try to fix people, just listen. And number four, focus on my changes, not somebody else's. I need honest community. This is how we change. A year from today, what's gonna make you different will be the books you've read and the people you've associated with. And if you associate with people who are on the grow, guess what, you're gonna be on the grow. You get in a small group, then you're gonna be growing too. Finally, number six, the sixth thing you need to change. 
is transformation requires faith. Transformation requires faith. You must believe you can be different with God's help. You must believe that this next year can be different than all the other years in the past. The person who says I can and the person who says I can't, they're both right. God says you've gotta believe. The Bible says whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Now here's what the Bible tells us in Ephesians. Now by his, that's God's, mighty power at work within us. See, it's God working in us. We talked about that at Christmas. God is able, circle the word able. That's the new ability we talked about on Christmas Eve. Now by his mighty power at work within us, God is able. Notice none of those three sentences, three phrases, have anything to do with willpower. Not you forcing yourself to change. His mighty power at work within us, God is able. This is God working in your life. That's what transformation happens. God is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of, even dream of. And he says, infinitely beyond our highest prayers and desires and thoughts or hopes. So let's st just stop here for just a minute. I'm a pretty big dreamer. You figured that out by now. God says, Rick, you think of the biggest thing I could do in your life and I can top that. I've had some enormous dreams in my lifetime and God has bypassed every single one of them. Why? Because I am a man of faith. I have a lot of weaknesses in my life. Just ask me or ask anybody who knows me. I got a lot of weaknesses. But I am a man of faith. And I have the ability to trust God for things that other people simply aren't willing to trust him for. And so we set big goals and we dream great dreams and we watch God do bigger than we ever thought. God says, Rick, you can think of the biggest thing I can, you could ever think of I could do in your life and I could top that. Now, how about you? God says to you, as we are at the end of one year and the beginning of another, think of the greatest thing you'd like to see done in your life this next year. God says, I can top that. Will you trust me? Read it again. Now by his mighty power at work within us, God is able to do far more, not just more, far more than we would ever even dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers and desires and thoughts or hopes. That is faith. Remember we did the series in Philippians, all in the, in the fall. Philippians 4.13 says, let's read this verse aloud together, okay? Let's read it aloud. I can do all things through Christ who empowers me. I'm ready for anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I love that in the Amplified Translation. Now, circle the words can do. You gotta have a can do attitude. Not a cannot attitude, but a can do attitude. According to your faith, Jesus said, it will be done unto you. You get to choose how much God blesses your life. You get to choose. Now, what do you gotta do? You gotta just make a simple step. First step for you would simply be to sign up to register.
the 50 days of transformation. Inside your program, there's a flap. And if you are in a small group, then you can continue in that. If you're not in a small group, you can start one. We'll help you. You can be a host. Look at that. It says host. Four things when it means to start a small group. And here's what you do. Here's what you do. You get one person. Get one person and say, will you go through this material with me? They can be your spiritual partner. You can coach each other. Get one person to go through this material with you, and then maybe you say, let's find one, have that person find another, then you got three. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You don't have to have a crowd. You don't have to have 10 people in your small group. You don't even have to have six. Three or four, that's great. You can have as many as two or three or four. And, and, and just say, well, I want my life to be changed. Find one person who's interested in change. And, and sign up and say, I want to be a part of that. Now, for those of you who say, I want to get started on the physical health part. Next week, we're going to uh, uh, launch the new version of Daniel Plan. We did it two years ago, and we didn't even know what we were doing. Okay? We didn't even know what we were doing two years ago. And, uh, you know, 12,000 people lost a quarter of a million pounds, 250,000 pounds. That's what I call church decline, not church growth. We took out an ad on the Daniel Plan book, said, shrink the size of your church, Rick Warren. Because <laughs> I'm known for growing churches. And, and Pastor go, Rick's telling me to shrink my church. Yeah, the size of it. So here's what I want you to do. If you, if you want to be a part of the Daniel plan, that's great. Not everyone has to be a part of that, but it's one of the features of 50 Days of Transformation. Now, we've been selling the book, uh, Daniel Plan, uh, a discount here for 15 bucks. We can get it for 15 bucks. But here's what I'll tell you. If you'll get one this weekend, buy one for 15 bucks, and I'll give you another one free. That's for you to give to your friend for your spiritual partner. So go out this weekend and say, I'm gonna get a book, 15 bucks, and I'll give you another one free, and then you go to one person and say, hey, we're gonna do this 50 days of transformation, and one of the seven key areas is physical health. Would you like to be healthier? Yeah, okay, then here, here's a book. We're gonna read this together, and there's a whole bunch of material on that. You can sign up. Friends, this is gonna be exciting. Next week, we're gonna have a rally from three to five in the afternoon, on Sunday afternoon at the Lake Forest campus with the doctors who helped me design the Daniel plan. And these guys are so practical. You know, when I talked about, uh, I was thinking today about, uh, uh, about cleaning house, about just get the stuff out of your way so you're not even tempted by it. I have to tell you a funny story. We were in New York City and we had done all these interviews and that night we went out to dinner and we sat down to dinner and I was so hungry. I mean, I just talked my mouth off all day. And they came and they brought this big basket of hot, yeasty rolls. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. Eating one of those rolls, you may as well just be spooning sugar into you because it actually turns to sugar faster than sugar does. Okay? And it, go, it goes right here to right here. Okay? And so, I said to the doctors, I said, guys, Man, that is so tempting to me. And Daniel Lehman called, called the waiter over and said, Sir, would you remove the bud, bread and butter plates and the butter, bread? And this guy came, picked up the plate, took the bread away. <laughs> he goes, better say no once than 35 times. <laughs> because if it had stayed there, I would have looked at it for the rest of the evening. Going, Man, that really looks good. That really, <laughs> you, woo, baby, that's looking good. That, that tastes really good right now with my other food. And, you know, I, you know, so I just made the decision one, clean house. You need to go home and clean house. Clean out the junk food in your mind. Clean out the junk food in your closet. Clean out the junk food on your coffee table. Clean out the junk food in your, in your kitchen and every other area because we're getting ready for a transformation. Are you with me on this? All right. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I'm so excited about what you're about to do in my life and in the life of all these people that I love, our family. Thank you for a wonderful Christmas. 
Thank you for all that you did in our lives and thank you that so many of our friends came to know you. So Father, as we look at these steps in the book of Ephesians chapter four, help us to, to do every one of them. To find a friend, to find a partner, to find a coach, a mentor, somebody who's gonna be a, a partner with us in the next 50 days. Help us commit to learning the truth and to new thinking. And Lord, help us to go home and clean house wherever that means and whatever that means in our lives. Help us to get rid of the things that slow us down, especially the things that distract us so we can run the race that lies ahead of us. Father, I pray that if there's anybody here who's not in a small group yet, that today they'll make that decision. I'm gonna get in a group and I'll start a group. And may they just find a friend and we launch a new group for these 50 days. Help us to be kind to each other. Help us to be loving with each other. Help us to be forgiving of each other. Help us to be supporting of each other. To say things that build each other up, that encourage each other, that benefit those who listen. And Lord, as we start this journey together, I ask you to build our faith. Thank you that when your work when you're at work within us, that your mighty power within us, you're able to do far more than we could ever dare to ask or dream of. And I know, Lord, that all of us have had dreams and some of them have been truncated and some of them have been delayed and some have been pushed back. May this be the year that the dream comes true. May this be the year that the transformation happens. May this be the year that we say, I can do all things through Christ who empowers me. You have said, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. So build our faith, and I thank you in advance for what you're gonna do. Lord, it would be a waste of time for us to go into these 50 days not expecting you to revolutionize these seven key areas of our lives. And so I thank you in advance for the incredible stories that will come out of this journey together. And I pray this blessing in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen.